first and foremost, I'm so glad we finally made this happen. I remember I started the podcast, actually it was March of 2019 when I was at uh, community college and I reached out to you and you said, sure, we'll do the podcast then. And like, it never, never actually happened. So it's been, we've been kind of playing phone tag with it and now here we are. So That's right, I'm man. absolutely excited that we were able to come, come back around and, and make this happen. So first and foremost, just how have you been? Man, I've been good. It's, I mean, I think part of the reason it's been hard the past year, as, as we all know, is this weird pandemic changing yeah. things so crazily. Crazy. But um, I'm really grateful with with how life's gone the past six to eight months, and I'm aware of the privilege I have in in being able to uh, have had an okay couple months. I'm hoping things get better for all of us right. very, very soon. But mm. yeah, musically, I've. I've done more this year than I was expecting, which is really? very odd. Yeah. More like studio type of work, obviously. Yeah, a lot more re remote recording sessions. Mm -hmm. um, I actually did some work, quite a bit of work, at a couple of studios in L.A. with COVID oh, wow. restrictions. Mm -hmm. so we did that, a record with a wonderful friend named Comrade Sewell. Nice. Um, and um, yeah, I've been doing this Twitch stuff, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, later. But right. uh, that's been a really fun way to stay creative and connected for to six days a week online with people. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you've got you've got a great setup. I've never done one of these before, so this is new. Um, so yeah, it's kind of exciting. I'm kind of anxious, certainly. Um, but yeah, this is this is awesome. Now, when stuff really started to hit the fan for you guys back in March, mm -hmm. I mean, w at what point did you guys collectively, your group and um, people that you you'd play with kind of say, okay, maybe we should pull the trigger on this, on this thing. Mm. Pull I mean, the trigger. That's a tough, yeah, like on stop playing. Because I know right. um, when I talked to, to Zappa, he said that it was, it was hard because there was one show, they got to the venue and they had everything set up. People were right. there, seats were filled. They said, you can't play. They go, we're playing. Like it, right. for an artist, it had to be hard to be like, okay, we're done. We're just going to sit it out and see what happens. How did everything unfold for you guys? Yeah, man. Well, it, what's weird is it started a couple months before the pandemic. We had a few mm. canceled shows for Johnny mm -hmm. Lang, who I see in the background there. Yes. Um, yeah, there were a couple of, of different family engagements and things that had to be changed. Mm -hmm. And so we canceled our final three shows of 2019 oh, wow. with Johnny. And I thought, okay, well, this happens. Tours cancel shows all the time sure. for a plethora of reasons. Sometimes the venue has, has to cancel because mm. they didn't have the, uh, the the infrastructure they thought they did. And mm. Sometimes they're really sad about that because they right. sold out tickets and they, oh, sorry, we can't do it. Um, so that happens from time to time. I thought it was business as usual going mm. into 2020. Um, but I had already planned not an exit from music, but an augmentation or, or an augmenting oh, of my music career. Really? Yeah, so I was getting back into acting uh, September of last year, auditioning oh, wow. more and, and doing that. And so I thought, well, these shows are being canceled. 2020 mm -hmm. is going to be the year of re-emerging um, as an actor. So this right. is great. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and to that point, I got cast in a show in Los Angeles. It was Hair the Musical at the LGBT Center. Oh, wow. And I was playing Claude in that show. So we were just set to open, and the pandemic hit 11 days before we opened. So oh, wow. Yeah, that was that was tough. I mean, I was really excited about getting back into acting, and I still am. It's still very sure, much something yeah. I'm, I'm exploring and doing. But, yeah, it was very odd for me because I was really interested in that transition, and mm -hmm. I didn't get to have it happen exactly the way I was dreaming. But, sure. man, my problems are very small compared to what everyone else is going through. Um, and then, yeah, as far as, as far as music, there was also a gig I had, a private gig with a band I have. Mm-hmm. Um, called Evan and Zane, and we were supposed right. to play this this concert in um, not San Luis Obispo. It's in um, shoot Santa Clara County, I think. Okay, up in the north. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the first nine cases of serious spreading of COVID were right. in that county. Oh God! So we had a gig on March 11th, and they canceled our gig on March 9th. And no as you know, in the music industry, private gigs are you know merch, touring, private gigs. Sure, are kind absolutely. Of how you make yeah. a living. So it was it was a pretty big blow. So yeah, there was there were some challenging things, but Man, we'll talk about this throughout the interview. I've, Absolutely. I've been so lucky to find an audience online that's been there with me through this time. Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky. No, no, absolutely. And the crazy thing is I remember, too, you, you kind of did have a break, too, at the start of the year, too, because I think Johnny actually, I think he came down with vocal. He had vocal issues. Right. Um, so that kind of 
Twitch shows kind of, it was a little bit slower at that time too, but, uh, right. Right. Uh, no, it's just absolutely crazy. Now crazy. I always find your backstory just rather interesting. Like hmm. it's, it's like everywhere. Like there's not, it's what don't you do? That's, that's, okay, I'm, I'm a chaotic there. neutral. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it, this. it's, it's nuts. I mean, you started from what I understand as you act, acting was something that you really wanted to do. And then you kind of shifted towards music what sparked that shift you. that's a great question um i was a 12 year old or 13 year old kid and i mm -hmm. really loved school and this is a true story i told my mom i loved math i loved science i wow. loved history class and i was just having a hard time going to auditions and doing my studies mm -hmm. thankfully i didn't have a stage mom so there was no pressure to perform or act yeah um so i remember on the day to my final audition for a film called my giant which i ended up booking and doing on the way to that audition, I asked her if I could quit. And I'm talking, it was, an, it was a question to her. Oh, Immediately the answer was, there wasn't even a yes. There was a phone call on her end to my agency saying Zane's quitting. Um, I just felt like it was too much. I was taking on too much. And I, I don't know, I wasn't even trying to do anything that's morally superior or right. obviously career-wise it was to some people a mistake, at least my agents at the time. But to me it just felt like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And through that, I started really focusing more in jazz band class. Right. Mm -hmm. This is a true story. And then that's how I became more of a guitar player. I was just studying. I liked learning. Studying. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I remember a 2016 interview um, you recorded saying that you considered yourself the black sheep of your family musically um, as far yeah. as. Um, because of being the jazz guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. elaborate on that. I mean, was it yeah. as far as interest and likings go, was it really that polar opposite? I was being hy hyperbolic a bit with that statement, but <laughs> but we grew up, you know, it was Elton John a little bit in the house, definitely yeah. a lot of Billy Joel, some ABBA. I mean, I'm giving away my parents' taste in a, in a way they would not appreciate because they were mostly <laughs> Beatles fans. They had really great taste. But they also played this sort of 70s, 80s sure. uh, singer-songwriter music. Um, Joni Mitchell was sometimes in the house. And yeah, there was a lot of that great deliberate songwriting stuff going on. What I gravitated towards was Mariah Carey and Boys to Men and Jordan Knight and oh, wow. Michael Jackson and more R and B music, which they loved as well, but it wasn't as dominant in our house. So yeah, I think I at that age I didn't know that the reason I loved R and B music was because I loved jazz music. Mm -hmm. I just knew, oh, I like these riffs and I like how these chord changes make me feel, but I didn't know what the chord changes were or why they made me feel that way. It wasn't until I was about thirteen or fourteen I started studying music theory and oh, wow. I realized Oh, Jordan Knight's um, single from the 90s or early 2000s is literally the same chord changes as Autumn Leaves. It's just, it's in 3-4 instead of 4-4. Four, four. Wow, yeah. that's, what? So those light bulbs went off right at the beginning of high school. And that, mm -hmm. that really made me focus even more on music and more on guitar. Because at the end of the day, my, you know, you, you, you said it in a really interesting way that there's sort of this, not chaotic, but there's this sort of the random, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of random stuff. My story's kind of, um, octopusy, and that's not what, <laughs> what am I trying to say? It's like an octopus. I, I so, know what you're trying to say, yeah. I'm trying to say, so, um, there are many tentacles to it, and I, um, yeah, I, what's the point I'm trying to make? Oh, the, the common thread for all this is I, I'm right. very curious and I love learning. So, mm -hmm. that's where music kind of came in in high school. I had an opportunity to learn in a music class, and I, I grabbed it by the horns, as it were. Right. No, interesting. Yeah. And I think the thing that, um, was kind of cool too is you ended up going to actually pursue school for that you went to usc's uh, thornton school of music um was it why why that choice like was it just mm. were you dead set on that or was that just like hey that's i'm a gonna fun go question. here i don't know if i've ever answered that that's a that's a cool question because i was not dead set on it in fact two or three months into my studies at usc and mm -hmm. i studied at the thornton school of music for mm -hmm. studio jazz guitar uh i I was going to quit music and get back into acting. I had called my agents at APA. Mm -hmm. I had a um, pretty serious skin problems in high school, and they'd finally oh, cleared up in college. Oh, wow. So I thought, all right, well, now I can act again. Let's get back into <laughs> acting. So even as a music major at college, I was not convinced I'd be a professional musician as a career. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I'm not quite sure when that shift really happened. It must have been over that summer uh, between freshman and, junior and, and sophomore year of college. But... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I went to USC because there are two reasons. One, I had applied to Juilliard, didn't even get an audition. Really? I, yeah, I applied to University of North Texas, and I think I got accepted. I don't quite remember. Well, that's but, an um, interesting one. 
And that's exact because it's very sight reading based. It's a very hardcore guitar program. Um, and I ended up choosing UC, USC out of three or four schools. Mm -hmm. or no, seven or eight schools that accepted me. Most of them were the UCs in the California, you know, UC Irvine and UCLA. And I right. got into all the UCs. And then I got into USC, University of North Texas, and I think maybe Berkeley or something else. Yeah. And I just had this gut feeling that being in the town where music's actually made was more important than going to Texas or Boston and being away from the action for four years. So sure. stayed in LA, figured, well, I can do both. I can play gigs and I can learn. Yeah. And it, it, it really worked out well for me. I'm very grateful with how it worked out. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, with, with the acting thing as the backup, I mean, if I think you made the smart choice to kind of right yourself there, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't know that because I think you you were at uh, USC was it like two thousand two thousand three to two thousand four two thousand three. Mm -hmm. But awesome. what's weird is I'm still nineteen because I live in Hollywood. So. Yeah, there you go. No, it's the truth. I mean, that's what it is. It, the thing is though, too, is being in your position now. If you look back, how much harder is it to uh, make it? in that hmm. area i mean because it the cesspool of people has grown it's just like guitars you could lift up a rock and find a billion of them yeah it, it, which is the beauty of something like instagram there are so many great guitar players that i mm -hmm. think a lot of us didn't know about right because they were living in wisconsin they were living in iowa they were and now it's like everyone gets to have a seat at the table thank god mm -hmm. um, i prefer to live in a world where i'm very small and not notable but i'm surrounded by great art because i think that's one right. of our greatest most important achievements as humans is mm -hmm. our expression of togetherness through oh, yeah. art forms. Um, so it's exciting to find out every year, oh, there's another 19-year-old girl living in Spain who's the most killing classical guitar right. player. And there's this kid over in Germany who's just, what, how, are you, how do you know how to play like this? These the amazing new bands, Polyphia and Covet and that kid Gabriel, Gabriel Garcia, I forget his last name, but just these incredible new sounds mm -hmm. and styles. So yeah, I mean, with, with acting, it's challenging because I think the hardest part with acting is getting your foot in the door, getting auditions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Whereas with music, you can just put up a thing on Instagram and it grows if you're impressive. Yeah. There's not as much of a market for just putting up monologues on Instagram and having people you know, appreciate them. So right. you really kind of got to get auditions and get in with casting directors and develop those relationships, which I've been trying to do even during this pandemic. So it's, it's an interesting time as an artist. And yeah, I'm, I'm just... I feel very lucky to have a few different creative outlets because I, I think diversity has been my saving grace during this pandemic. Oh, Being sure. able to just, oh God, I'll try that, I'll try this, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I think you have to career-wise too, even pre-pandemic, it's something that needed right. to be done. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I found interesting though, when you did Carney, um, <laughs> that, I mean, when you did that, it was a brother, I think it was Interscope was, right. you were assigned to. You, how did creatively how did that work because you sang that musically you were kind of uh, out there and i mean now you how did you come together and create on kind of a level that you could both agree on hmm. um, and not fight over like products i mean that's kind of hard when you're coming right. from two different backgrounds how did you find that sound that both pleased you guys i think there were a couple of things that helped us one is i'm the younger brother so sure. i could not run away from my older brother's influence. And I mean mm -hmm. that in a positive sense because he's an absolute musical genius. So mm -hmm. when he would dial in his tone, I was a jazz guy, right? I'd turn my tone knob off and that's sure. what I did. And he'd be dialing in the mid range specifically in the trebles and I would watch him and I'd study and go, huh, oh, I might try that sound. And then the next day, mm -hmm. suddenly I sound like Johnny Greenwood when I've never played like that, purely because I was inspired by these tonal shifts that I saw mm -hmm. him doing. Um, he inspired me by getting me into John Bryan and really deeper Beatles cuts and, and all that. And, and so, yeah, we did share a lot of, of similar um, interests. Uh, but also, I think the band became uh, a little more singular because of our differences mm -hmm. of, uh, of approach. So, for example, there's a song called Amelie on mm -hmm. our record, and that's sort of a genreless song. It's sort of Les Paul, sort of Django, but definitely rock and roll and... There are a lot of different genres there. And my brother wrote that song after sort of seeing me grow up into my jazziness. He's oh, like, wow. you know, I want to write a song that shows you off. So he wrote that song. Um, so our, our band was influenced by my ideas. And then the cool part in Carney was my role was lead guitar player and very sparingly co-writer. Uh, towards the end of our band, we were co-writing more. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, it was just Reeve's songs and I was the lead guitarist. 
But on our recordings, I'd do three, four, five, six, seven guitar parts sometimes. Oh, wow. And I would also do Mellotron parts with my brother. We'd you know, kind of co-produce the record together and piano ideas. And so my jazz foundation really allowed us to have limitless expression with our orchestrations and arrangements. Sure. So if we heard an idea and I said, well, the song's in G major and I'm going to play a C sharp on this guitar and then an E natural on this guitar and neither of those notes mm -hmm. occur in a G major triad, but they will create a sixth interval yeah. that's allows the sharp 11 to, th th you know, I'm not, I don't normally it's talk about it. just music theory. You're just penetrating yeah. my, my skull right now. Yeah, with yeah. But just trying little things here and there that I knew would bring out the flavor of the dish. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that, that really helped our band, I think, communicate Reeves' already otherworldly brilliant songs. Mm -hmm. So, oh, whoops, it's, there's something possible on the screen. Oh, there we go. Cool. Yeah, cool. Um, so, yeah, I think having those differences of opinion is the beauty of the band. I mean, not to mention the fact that John Epcar, our drummer, and Aiden Moore, our bassist, also came from very different backgrounds. Sure. John came from sort of a... I don't know. I mean, he had so many things he was into as a kid. He went through so many phases from wow. Dave Grohl to, to, uh, uh, like punk rock, like hardcore music. Mm -hmm. He was into all these different things and he brought that aggression into our band. And then our bassist Aiden is the funk master. He brought all this, he was in a band with, with Ronald Bruner back in the day called, uh, young men. It's like R and B pop. Band. Like he's just had a whole different ex experience as well. And so those four different, uh, things are what created wow. the sound of Carney, and yeah, yeah, I'm very excited about about the fact that I was involved in that band, and I hope sure. one day we get back together and well, you do should something. Be. I mean, the the opportunities that came from that's insane. Before insane. I get, yeah, before I get onto that, I mean, since you mentioned on you know that one song being considered genreless, hmm. this is a question that I always like to bring up. As far as classification goes in the industry, as soon as you come out with a record, everyone wants to know what you are. Right. So for guys like Kenny Wayne Shepherd, he always said, well, yeah, the blues is what got, that's what made me, made the name for me, but I'm not, I'm a musician who will play country or Southern rock, maybe heavier rock. I, I would classify myself as a musician more than a blues musician because you don't right. want to pigeonhole yourself creatively in the industry's eyes. Has right. that been a struggle for you? And how would you kind of, I mean, how would you identify your sound as a whole? Hmm. I'm very lucky that I haven't struggled with that question. I know sure. a lot of young guitar players, even even guitar players around my age, do struggle with that. How am I going to market myself? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why. I, I struggle in so many areas in life mentally. I obsess. I get hang-ups. And yet in yeah. this one area, I feel rather free. Um, maybe similar to a chef if they made a dish. I'll let someone else decide if it's a French Italian dish or an Italian French dish or a Moroccan. Mm -hmm. It's like I don't. I, how does it taste to your mouth? Do you enjoy the flavor? That's right. that's more my concern. Um, uh, with Carney, we used to joke that the genre of our band was Mysterioso. I, I came <laughs> up with that. I was like, I don't know, because it's, it's nothing. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Um, my, when it comes to my playing, it's funny. I mean, a, a lot of people don't know that I've recorded on. Not not too many records. I'm not a huge studio rat. I toured mostly because I had Carney, and then sure. we'll get to the mayor and the land. Oh, and I know. I can't wait to that part. Yeah, but so I've done mostly touring and live performance. Uh -huh. I, I was out of town probably 220 days a year on average the past 15 years. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not joking even. Um, and four of those years were in New York City where I didn't have a studio because I was doing a mm -hmm. Broadway show. But yeah, just a lot of time out of town. So... Um, but still, I've been lucky to play on quite a few records. And if a producer needs something from me and has an idea of a genre in mind, that helps me lock in onto what I can do to support the artist and support the producer sure. in that song. But that being said, a lot of times people call me because they want me to do whatever it is I do. Mm -hmm. And I've never quite gotten a clear idea on what it is I do. I, really? I, yeah, I mean, because I, I, I can kind of play the blues. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> be, I'm best at jazz. That's definitely oh. my strength. But I'm not that good enough at jazz to... Like, you know, there are a lot of Instagram guys right now who do straight up bebop, and I'm not actually that good at that. People think I am, but I'm actually not. Um, my Django type playing is not Django ish. My West type playing is certainly not West ish. Mm -hmm. um, I think my number one thing is I love flavors and I love sure. combining them in ways that make me excited. And oftentimes those are outside of genre. But I'm never trying to be subversive. I'm never trying to say, oh, let's make this classical, but Lana Del Rey. Let's right. make this jazzy, but but not West Montgomery. Right. I'm just going, oh, I love how this C sharp sounds when my tone is down this way combined with this triad. I love that. 
what what is that? I don't know. Someone else can decide for me, but I just like that feeling. Sure. So that's always been my. I, it comes back to that first answer of uh, as a kid, I gave up acting because I loved learning and curiosity. Mm -hmm. My curiosity is what guides whatever people perceive as my genre, if that wow. makes sense. No, 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 totally. That that's crazy. And to get on, I mean, the Carney, you that group. I mean, just from. I, I don't even know how to describe it from you two, Fergie. I mean, when, right. when, when you found out that Bono said that your best uh, guitarist in New York is you, I mean, what's going through your head? You're, like, you're calling BS right away, right? Yeah, well, just because I was like, what? Well, first off, I told our manager that in confidence, and then he put it in my bio to so the point where now it's <laughs> basically permanently online. And I was saying, dude, this is just a thing he said in yeah, front of like, the editor it, at Rolling yeah. Stone. It wasn't like an on-record yeah. thing. So maybe if he read that, he'd go, what the heck, Zane? But yeah. I do not feel that I'm the architect behind everyone sure. knowing that. Um, I've left it in the bios recently because it already was so proliferated. I went, all right, I guess I'm just going to embrace this. Right. And For there have sure. been other mm -hmm. things people have said off the record that I haven't put because I don't have that manager anymore. And I'm like, I just want right, to be careful with that. Yeah, yeah I don't want to like, make people think that I'm trying to latch on to no, them. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, and, and um, by the way, quick funny story. That turned Go into me going, going to Japan yeah. and I was doing headlining shows of my own. And it's funny. I mean, I, I'm not signed to a major record deal. Mm -hmm. I haven't released a new record in six years. I've been right. busy with other artists that I've been, you know, working with and trying to help their vision come to life and all that jazz. Um, and to be frank, I, I haven't prioritized myself the way that I probably should have, but that's mm -hmm. okay. But what I have done is a lot of live shows as a solo artist in LA, Nashville, New York, Canada, Mexico, yeah. Japan, all that. Um, and so I was in Japan and the posters they had made in Japanese said, Bono says, best guitar player in New York. And it worked. It got people to come. But I said, oh, oh of God. course. And people were chanting like, do a U2 song during the set. I said, oh, I don't geez. know any. Yeah. So I ended up learning one on the spot during a show. And now I do that song <laughs> most of my set, which is still haven't found what I'm looking for. Yeah. But anywho, um, yeah, I, I, things like that were really meaningful to me. And I don't quite know why people feel that way about me because... I don't know. I, I've never tried to be the master technician and I've never tried to be uh, the tone perfectionist. I mean, I care about all these things, but sure, I yeah. I just follow whatever the day makes me feel like I want to follow. And it's cool that that's turned into people liking my playing. That's that's pretty special. Yeah, no, it's got to be a trip. Now, opening for, I mean, <laughs> what what is that experience like? I mean... That was the coolest show. Yeah, so we were able to open. Carney opened for U2's final 360 tour show. Ridiculous. And, and the bill was Carney, Arcade <laughs> Fire, U2. So it was like... Diverse, oh, very. <laughs> my gosh. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, it was really special, but it's... I mean, I'm giving away my, my younger brotherness yet again, but one of the most special moments that I remember to this day was I stood back while my brother sang Bohemian Rhapsody. Because during mm -hmm. that time of our band, we were doing that song in our set, and it was just a solo piece he would do for ah. about two and a half minutes. And I took a photo of it and looked at him singing this song by himself in front of 70,000 people. It's and insane. Thought, Man, Absolutely this is so insane. cool. And I'm sure he felt the same when I stepped forward right. and took my Amelie solo in front of 75,000 people. And we, we're, we're just both pretty, this is the only part of the interview where I will even very slightly dip into hubris. But what I love about both of us, Reeve and myself, and the entire band, Carney, is we're, sure. all of us were rather fearless. We, we did not seize up when the moment came. We, we stepped be, yeah. into, into it. So it, I love that, Vanna. And in fact, I know this podcast is coming out after my show, but, sure. but uh, tonight, for the people who are on Twitch, I'm doing uh, a show of just Carney songs, and I have to mm -hmm. practice them after this interview, in fact. But that video will be up for the next, I don't know, two months, month and a half or so That's awesome. on my Veep. So I'll, I'll get you a link to that if you want. Absolutely, man. That that's just mm -hmm. that's awesome. I appreciate mm -hmm. you doing that. Um, I I think when when the U two and all that stuff happened, then Avril Lavigne, Fergie, all that stuff kind of happened. That kind of transitioned into something that kind of goes back to a point you mentioned earlier: social media, people online, they watching videos, sending emails. Right. John Mayer shoots you an email. Now, when you get that email from him, I mean. You get an email from someone. Was it actually him or was it his management it was, group? Just his, his team. Yeah, they said, hey, we'd yeah. like to talk to you about some work. This was in 2013. It's cool mm -hmm. that you know all this stuff. It's awesome. Oh, I, love, um, I love the music. Yeah, love man. It, man. But it's cool that you know about that email. Yeah, I was trying to get back into acting at that sure. time as well. Um, and I had just left a casting director's office and mm -hmm. was auditioning for a lot of pilots at the time. And I got that email, and that was just too exciting. When I responded, I found yeah. out that they were looking to have me play guitar and to record with him for a, a, quite a long time. And sure. I just talked to my agents at Paradigm and said, I, I think 
this is a real opportunity. Yeah. The acting thing I do want to do, but this is an offer for something monumental mm -hmm. with one of my, as a child, one of my favorite guitar player songwriters and as an adult now, one of my favorite people. So I was like, this yeah. just, That's I awesome, got to do this. And thankfully, no one was upset. Although right. a couple of people on the team did say, well, that's cool, but you know, the acting thing is really here for you right now. So are you sure? I said, yeah, because yeah, I haven't gotten an offer yet yeah. for a job and I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity. I mean, I just, again, as I'm saying these things, I'm going, man, how lucky have I been that I've been right. able to be offered these, these options and choices. So I, I haven't really wrapped my head around what I can do one day to, um, I don't know, to give to really appreciate to, everything kind of yeah and to be i don't know, give back to the to whatever it is that has allowed me these opportunities so that's kind of where my head is today other days i get depressed and confused as most artists do I think everyone today i'm does. going yeah. i'm going man i'm so lucky this is crazy man. yeah no i i have people say that too sometimes when i talk to them like they go oh I, I never never thought about that never looked at it that way and i'm like i was like that's not the goal but it's like i think you, you do need to pause take a moment and realize like wow I'm pretty damn blessed to have really all these am. opportunities. But at the same totally. time, it's also important to remain grounded like everyone who's ever said that on my show because at that same time, they don't even think about that. They just, you know, they're right. doing what they're doing. Right, um, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, if, if everyone could be have an ego and, you know, talk about it 24-7, it's like, okay, we get it. Like, right, we'll right. do something else. But, um, yeah, no, you know, Paradise Valley, that happens. How, right. how does that work, though? I mean... Cause I, I'm trying to figure this out. So you you get that email, and then it was a San, it was a Sans audition or whatever that he. Yeah. How, that was what a is lot of what trust is that, how does that work? I think he just he knew about my work with Carney. He knew about my work on Broadway, and he had I think done a deep dive into YouTube videos of just seeing R&B gigs I did, gospel gigs, jazz yeah. gigs, southern rock gigs. I mean, these are genres that I guess other people had had, and I right. did whatever I do in those, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think he was excited about having a band at that time that was rather genreless because sure. sort of jammy, sort of rock, sort mm -hmm. of blue. Yeah, yeah. All these things. He wanted versatility. And uh, it's really, it meant a lot to me that he thought uh, he had gathered that from you listening to our records and, mm -hmm. and our stuff online. And yeah, I flew out to do the Ellen show with him. And thankfully that went well. So it was, yeah, this was a good choice. Let's keep saying it around. Yeah. So that was kind of my audition playing on Ellen with him. Really? And, wow. uh, I guess. I mean, that was the first thing I ever played in front of him. And throughout really? that tour, he encouraged me to just be more and more uh, myself. There were a couple nights on tour where I'd do a solo, and and I was really not thinking about fitting into the mold. I was just doing yeah. what I do. And mm -hmm. instead of saying, slow down, calm down, Zane, mm -hmm. he's like, do, do more, and I want you to do another solo each night yeah. on this song. I'm going to keep throwing you curveballs. I want to see what you do. Very, very cool, man. I was very lucky. Because yeah, no. I do that every night in my own shows, but yeah. my audience is obviously significantly Different. microscopic yeah. compared to 20,000 sure. people a night, you know? Very cool. Yeah. No, that's insane. So, and the cool thing is that was actually done, that record, Paradise Valley, was recorded in Electric Lady. Um, actually, he, oh, th th you know what? May I? Go for it. so much homework. So Electric Lady, <laughs> he actually did this record with Chick Corea and Walter, like the whole crew, you know? Really? Uh, Walter, yeah, so he did that record there. Paradise Valley, maybe he did some of it there, but I, I actually recorded with him at the Village Studios in Santa oh, Monica. You know what? He did He did a lot of he, Born and Raised in a That's right. Because that's I right. remember it was right after he had that vocal thing. Even yep, in that, the granular during that album, he, he almost had to stop because he had How great is that record, though? Oh, my god! Oh, it's my favorite one. Like I think I, it's my favorite, too. I mean, it's just the most... I think that was more of like the hey, this is this is this is the real me inside. This is me screaming to escape. But, um, anyways, forget that. So yeah. you you get in there and how how does that work though? Like the the rehearsing those for for a tour like that. I mean, you're going from um, a little bit different type of production to a this type of production right. as far as rehearsing goes. How how did how did all that kind of come to be? Man. I loved the process we had. So I, I went straight from Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark where I was playing the sure. same set eight days a week. So mm -hmm. six, some days I was doing two shows a day yeah. to learning 60 songs in about two weeks before our first rehearsal. Jesus. I would take that any day over playing the same set. As much as I, I'm grateful to Broadway and love that job, I, I love learning. And in fact, my Twitch channel, which what we do a lot on there is this thing called a live learn. Mm -hmm. So a live learn is someone donates between... $25 for this oh, wow. goofy thing called a one listen live learn where I just listen to a song once and play it back, which is kind of a magic trick, I guess. Interesting. 
and then it goes all the way up to a thousand bucks if you want me to spend 12 hours wow. charting out like an Emerson, Lake and Palmer mm -hmm. masterpiece. So we have all these gradients in between. And so I'd say when I go on Twitch four days a week, I, uh, yeah, most of what I do are these live learns. So I love learning songs and I love charting them out. So when I got the call to learn, you know, all of John's previous material and, and all the born and raised stuff, it was fun for me. I love sitting down and understanding how things work. Again, coming back to that refrain of, I, I love learning and I'm very curious. So I love that process. And once we rehearse, I mean, I, I'm such a deliberate learner. I, I have a specific process for acting and music work mm -hmm. that allows me to show up basically on day one of rehearsal ready for the performance. Cause I, wow. I just don't do well with uncertainty. I, I mean, in the jazz impro improvisational sense, I love sure. uncertainty, but when it comes to being hired and having someone uh, feel calm and collected to guide the ship, if I'm a worker, if I'm a hired gun, I just, I don't want to show up not knowing what's going on. So there were times during the rehearsals with John where he would say, can you play this guitar part? And then I'd play it. Actually, play the other guitar part on the record. And then I'd play that. No, play the third guitar part, the yeah. high part. And I knew every guitar part on every song I had learned just because that made me feel excited and, and comfortable about with creating, you know? Just like if you're in jazz, like you don't want to improvise over a song where the changes keep changing and you have no idea what's happening. You want to know yeah, the no, changes. No, no. And yeah. then you can improvise. So, sure. yeah, that, that's the way that I show up to work. Absolutely. Now, um, w when it comes to your solo stuff, and I mean, you're, in, I mean, you're in so many projects, Evan and Zane, and then you did the the one with uh, Tommy King, um, oh, yeah. the little little thing there. I mean, when when it when it comes to doing all that, what what's the hardest part for you as far as management goes of your own self? Because I mean, self management is tough. Like, there's times, literally, even with this show, where it's like, oh yeah, everything's great. I'm booking so and so. I'm booking this, and like. Oh wait, I gotta slow down a minute. Like I got too much. Right. How do you how do you deal with everything? I mean, you have your hands in everything, literally. Man, I I deal with it terribly. Ask yeah, my girlfriend. Too. Ask. I'm so I'm just and I mean this in the sense of I overdo it. I have I have a hard time saying no. And sometimes I hear this voice in my head of a reasonable friend sure. who I, is is nameless. It's just <laughs> a, the concept of a reasonable friend saying, you know, you gotta learn to say no. Sure. And yet in my mind, that friend has a full-time job and a salary and it's set in stone. And it's easy to say no when you have a 40-hour work week. Right. I know this from having done Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark on Broadway. I know it's easy to say no when you know that your work is being appreciated, it's being honored financially, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to worry about that. But when you're a freelance solo artist, I mean, I have friends who have gone from making negative 10 grand one year to 400,000 the next year because their song got picked up yeah. by some artist and got cut. So it's a very wild journey. So I have a hard time saying no. So I go, well, yeah. this could be fun. I, I want to do this gig and I want to do this, um, produce this artist. And I want to go into the studio and make sure that this record I worked on is totally finished with 100% my guitars. And I have to, that means I got to give up my off day on Sunday <laughs> and go in and finish it. And I, um, so yeah, I was just talking to my, to my partner a couple hours ago before this interview saying, I, I did it again. I've overdone it. I don't know how I'm going to get everything done the next three days. Yeah. Um, so I'm constantly trying to work on that. I think for me personally, this is, I don't know that this applies to anyone else, but I've always felt that my path is much more creative than being a hired gun. And yet most of my work outside of Carney and a few other things right. has been hired gun. So Evan and Zane, that's creative work. And that's my band with Evan Rachel Wood for sure. listeners who are curious. Uh, Carney, my band with my brother Reeve and John and Aiden, obviously creative work. My solo artist stuff, obviously creative work. Um, but I've done a lot of stuff, you know, uh, being a hired gun for Mayer, for Johnny. I've co-written with Avril, and that's also creative work. But long story short, a significant amount of my time and energy has been touring with Jesse McCartney or Renee Olstead or Mayer or whoever mm -hmm. else. Um, and as much as I love those things, I think the path to learning to say no is going to be really putting my foot in the ground as a solo artist and releasing material I've been sitting on for six years and getting out there again. Uh, in the recorded space. Sure. I, I've been lucky to sell out shows in LA that I should not, I have no right selling out without a record out, but it's because people in LA are very supportive and have known about Carney and other things. Sure. So they show up. Um, but yeah, man, I, I got to take that next step into the recorded world. And that's, that's what I'm laser focused on, but I'm sorry this, this answer is so long, but no, even, no, as it's I, good. even as I say that I'm currently producing an artist and uh, Jeez, we're going to finish insane. that in the next couple of days. And, I'm uh, doing my Twitch stuff four days a week and yeah. making sure that's consistent because that's how I'm that going to be able insane. to 
It's so fun, dude. You gotta come hang. I, I don't that, understand how you do it. It's anxiety. <laughs> it's it's intense. But yeah, then there's a. I won't even list all the things that are going on, but it's been three months of me saying I need to start working on my records again, mm -hmm. and I haven't done one day on them. So I, I'm getting there. I'm getting there as fast as I can of of learning to trust the um, trust that things are gonna stay stable. But again, the pandemic has has it kicked sucks, all this man. stuff up. Yeah. Because I'm going, man, I just want to make sure I can make a living. I mean, that's what, right. what most of us, I think, are thinking about as musicians these days, not how do I perfectly express myself as an artist. So I'm, I'm still finding that balance. Yeah. But um, I have a feeling I'll get there in the next few months. I, I, feel, I feel that. Yeah, no, for sure. No, yeah, the, I mean, like the pandemic for me, it's like it took me, honestly, because I'm like, I don't really do much anyway. Like I worked at a, the, I work at the Arcata Theater in St. Charles. That's where I ran into you when you cool. played with Johnny. That's right. So, yep. so how, tell me how things have been for you, man. Well, I mean, granted, that's not my full-time job. I do have, I do have a full-time job. It's a sales job that kind of pays the bills. Great. And But the, that part-time job was my heart. So it's yeah, like, right. you know, and people, like I've gone from, it was like three shows a week, sometimes if it's super busy, five concerts a week working. Um, mm. And I loved it, but it took me like month seven to really right. realize how much I missed it because I never did anything. Like I was, I, outside of the theater, I was stayed home, did nothing ever. So right. it's like, now it's hitting me hard, like really I hard. Um, so my heart goes out to you, man. And I, I relate to that, man. That's, yeah, because I, I, I love being social. I'm sure I remember meeting you. You know, you're very yeah. social when you're mm -hmm. in that space. But maybe you and I were similar in high school. In high school, I was talkative and connected, oh, but I would go no. home and I wouldn't have play dates because I was, yes. I don't know why. That's what it know? was for me. In school, I was, I was the one that was always chiming up. But right. Every Friday night, you find me in my room. Exactly. Like, I, never, I never, I never go out anywhere. Like, I was just like, I don't want to get caught up in that. Like, yeah, same, man. And I got lucky because there were a lot of kids that, had a tough thing and, and, and had tough adult lives sure. because of, of, of getting caught up in stuff. My mom kept us very safe. And we, for me, it was video games. I was a Pokemon yes. player and an RPG player. Mm -hmm. And then I'd play along some jazz songs and transcribe stuff. And um, yeah, I remember actually one night I was, uh, I decided to audition for Juilliard and there was a um, Charlie Parker song called Cheryl, S -A -R -C -H -E -R -Y -L. C-H-E-R-Y-L. Um, I had never heard this head. It's a blues head, apparently. Hmm. And they said, oh, you need to send this in. So I transcribed it in about an hour, wow. or an hour and a half, and then recorded it in my bedroom and sent it off. And my brother, I remember him saying, whoa, that's crazy that you can do that. You can transcribe that fast. I, said, I don't know, man. But this is because I didn't really hang out with friends. Right. I would just come yeah. home and do this stuff. Um, so I, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to no. you know, promote too much, but that's kind of why the Twitch thing I think works out well is because absolutely. I, I love transcribing. I love that stuff. So we have fun together. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting off track, man. I'm, no, it's good, man. It's tough, man, not having that community and not being able yeah. to physically go see a show and hang mm -hmm. out with people after. And I'm glad seven, eight months in, you're finding a way to do that. I mean, you're doing a lot more of these podcasts. It seems yes, like. I started in March. What started is two weeks. And then I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to find more guests. Like, mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing is when um, – when you mentioned how your girlfriend is like very like, uh, I think you said she's like, yeah, just accept, just do it, just do it, just do it, and then eventually you kind of get lost in and everything. It's the same situation with me. I kept accepting, accepting, accepting. I'm like, hold on, hold on, slow down, and then mm -hmm. I stopped. Like I wasn't even gonna do any activity for like a month and a half. Like two days ago, I made that decision. I went on social media and said, I need to stop, figure out where yeah. I am in life, and yeah. make like I don't know. Like there's so much happening, and then I had a conversation with her, and she's like. She gave me a moment of clarity over the phone. I'm like, you know what? I need to do this. And it's not because for me, what I realized was when I said, hey, I need a break. I need to figure out what's happening in life. It's the messages that I got in texts and emails from people saying, right. hey, I'm 17 years old. Um, this, this kid in Florida, his name's Lane. He's like, I love your show, man. I'm like, oh, like. I'm like, wow, like people, this is helping people that. are being impacted. Yep. So it's like, if I'm helping people, I'm like, oh, I don't, I always want to help people. I'm like, this is helping them get through this. Right. I have to do this. So it was like, that I, was like a moment of clarity for me. I love that, man. And I, I think that'll help me because I, for me, I'm doing Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, every week I start at roughly 3 PM mm -hmm. on Twitch and I go sometimes seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours. These are long streams where I'm recording you know, music and they're watching my recording sure. process or I'm doing those live learns or I'm jamming along this tunes. One of the, my favorite things and, and, and simplest things to do on the channel is people donate 10 bucks to have me jam over any song. So sometimes oh, we do like that's 30, 50 a stream. It's just, they just throw in the donations. I just jam along to it. Um, so long story short, 
what I've heard a lot in the chat, and I, the chat, I'm, we're live on Twitch right now as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They can hopefully attest this, but yeah, we've kept each other company, and it, it's sure. meaningful, and it means a lot to me to, for, in this crazy time, to still have at least one person maybe who I'm slightly, barely helping their day be a teeny bit better. And like, sure. that's, that's good. Cause they're helping my day be better. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, they're, they're being generous with allowing me to keep this channel running basically right. by, by paying for these uh, menu items as I call them. And, and then I'm trying to give them back something in return. So, and you're doing something great too, man. People are listening and giving you listenership and that right. helps you grow this thing. And then you're providing them with these conversations. It's awesome, man. Yeah. And, and you know, your stuff, you, you've seen these acts live. Like yeah, all of them, I miss you know, it's awesome. it's awesome. It's so cool. Yeah, for sure. You know, and to, to kind of, before I wrap things up here, there was one other moment in the show and it happened kind of early on for me when I, when I started the podcast was when I talked to Bobby Rush, there was, mm. um, there was a moment in there at the end of the call and he goes, you know what? Like he, he like got off track. He goes, you know who I appreciate the most people like you, the young ones still supporting the blues. There's nobody yeah. who's ever wanted to talk to me that young. And I was just like, I had a moment. I'm like, okay, maybe like there's this responsibility because as time goes on, I mean, all we have left of the old, like the first wave is buddy guy, Bobby Rush. And well, for Chicago, 91 year old Jimmy Johnson, like right. it's Rush gone. I, I, everyone's right. leaving us. It's like, right. maybe I have this responsibility that I have to branch out and keep all this the good news, yeah. man. Yeah. Wow. This is absolutely crazy. But I can't thank you enough for actually we finally got this to happen. I'm so, so glad we exciting. finally did, man. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I was looking at my emails and go, dang, like I, when Johnny Lane came to the House of Blues, it was last August. Yeah. You're like, I remember I texted you on We were gonna do this in person. Yes. Yeah, so I was yeah, like, we're, I, know. I was like, oh, I never have, but it happened now. Um in I think the the, the chase to have the interview finally happen ended in the most perfect spot, 2020. Like, yeah, the way right. right. Uh, but uh, no, this has been great. I, I really appreciate you doing this. My absolute pleasure, man. Thank you for, you know, learning so much about my sure. life and, and bringing these questions in. This is so awesome. Absolutely. And, I, and I hope we'll see you over on, uh, on cool, Twitch. We're gonna, we hang out quite a bit, man. We have some fun Yeah, time. I saw your schedule. Yeah, and, and if you ever want me to, to put you down – for one of these shows on uh, on Mondays, I'm doing this Monday night residency on oh, Veeps. Wow. It's this okay. website. They do live streaming tickets. There's another thing you do, Jesus. I know. Well, the, <laughs> the thing about this though is I'm just you know kind of trying to to continue to keep my solo artist stuff alive. Yeah. So every Monday night I do a themed concert. Oh wow! For 90 minutes, and it's been so fun. We have so much fun, and uh, I think I might extend it into 2020 until the pandemic restrictions lift for live touring. Sure, yeah. My plan was just to do it till the end of 2020, but right. I didn't think about how winter is the worst time for viruses, so yeah, it's, it's probably going to be weird until April, May, June. Who knows? Yeah, it's way worse um, now. Crazy. Yeah, so I'm just going to I'm gonna keep doing them, but uh, yeah, man, I'd love to have you at one of the shows. Oh, man, that'd be, that'd be, be an absolute trip. I, yeah. I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, man, my pleasure. Awesome. Awesome.